Har shas behar. This parsha begins with a very special mitzvah. It is the mitzvah of Shemitah. Shemitah means that once in seven years, a farmer who lives in Eretz Yisrael does not do any work at all on any of his fields. That means it's like a Shabbos year. Just like once in seven days, all the Yidden rest and they don't do any malacha, any work at all. The same thing, once in seven years, it is a mitzvah to let alone all the work of the fields. Not to touch the fields, not by plowing, not putting in seeds, not doing any kinds of work. And the same thing is also with the vineyards where the grapes grow. No work at all shall be done during the entire seventh year. It's a year that is completely given over to Hashem. Shabbos la Hashem. And just like on Shabbos, all those who work during the week have more time to learn Tyra and to daven on Shabbos. The same thing is during the Shemitah year, the seventh year, all the farmers in Eretz Yisrael can spend so much more time learning Tyra. And as our Chachamim tell us, that just like on Shabbos, he who does not work on Shabbos and keeps it holy and spending the day with Limud HaTayra studying the Holy Tayra and doing the other mitzvahs of Shabbos he will be blessed with many many brachas for the entire week even though it means that he has to stop working one day of the week so he may think that he's going to get less money for his family. But the truth is just the opposite. By not working on Shabbos, Hashem will give a special bracha that during the six days of your work, you will be blessed with so many more brachas, with so much more parnasa. And the most important thing is, that the parnasa, the money that's made during the six days of the week, will be used only for happy and healthy causes. And the same thing is with the Shemitah year. Even though the farmers are so used to it that every year they plant, they sow, they take care of the vineyards, they do so much work, and later they see the delicious fruits and vegetables growing out and all the good wheat and grains that come from their field and then they stack everything away and keep it for the entire year yet when it comes the seventh year a farmer is not worried at all a farmer knows that just like Hashem gave him his parnasa for the six years, gave him all the fruits and vegetables and grains that he needs for himself and his family for the entire six years. The same thing Hashem will surely give him what he needs for the seventh year too. In fact, this is what the Torah tells us, that Hashem promises every Jew who lives in Eretz Yisrael and is going to keep the year of Shemitah the way Hashem wants, then, V'tzivisi es birchasi lachem. Hashem said, I will give my bracha for you, Bashana hashishis, during the sixth year. That's right. During the sixth year, which is the last year of working, right before the Shabbos year, Hashem is going to make the fruits and vegetables grow out in such a great measure 
so much more than any other year, so that every farmer will have enough fruits and vegetables and grains and everything he needs, not only for the sixth year, but would last for the seventh year too. That's right, he'll have enough food for the entire seventh year so that he should not have to work on his field. And even more than that, Hashem promised that on the sixth year, not only will it have enough food for the seventh year, but also for the eighth year. That's right. Because once the farmer starts working on his field, after the seventh year, he's going to have to wait a few months until everything starts growing out again. So what's about those couple of months in the eighth year? So Hashem promised that not only will he have enough fruits and vegetables and grains from the sixth year to last through the seventh year, but also all the way through the eighth year too. All the way until he will get new grain and new fruits and vegetables. So here a Yid sees how Hashem is the one who controls the world and is the one who decides how much food and how much parnasa a person gets. That's right. By strengthening our betach in our trust in Hashem and by showing it, by keeping the mitzvahs that Hashem gave us, especially the mitzvah of Shemitah, in this sechus Hashem blesses us that we shouldn't lose out anything at all. In fact, not only will we not lose out, but as Hashem promises us, that even if you eat less food during the seventh year, you're going to feel so satisfied as if you have eaten much more. And then, a very important thing is, that by keeping the mitzvah of Shemitah, the Yidn will be able to keep the land at its Israel. That's right. In order that the Yidden should be able to remain in Eretz Yisrael, they must keep the mitzvah of Shemitah. Now, during the year of Shemitah, as we just learned, no one is allowed to work on their fields. And not only that, the owner of the field is supposed to realize that he's really not the owner. Hashem is the owner of the entire land, just like Hashem is the owner of the entire creation. So therefore, all the things that are in the field become free for all. That's right, anyone can come into the field. The farmer must leave the gates open. He should not lock up the doors or the gates so anyone and everyone is invited to come and have whatever they want. Also animals can come and serve themselves. And do you know who else can come? That's right, the farmer himself. He can come just like any stranger. He could bring home any amount that he needs just for that day. For all the meals of that day he could take. But he can't take any more because he is not the owner of this field any longer. That's right. The farmer is not the owner of this field anymore. On the eighth year, then he becomes the owner once again. But there is one thing that the farmer is allowed to do during the seventh year. He's allowed to put water on certain plants that is in order to save the plants from dying. But he's not allowed to do anything else. No work at all. Now what's about the Sfichim? Sfichim are vegetables or grass that grow by themselves. They grow wild. Is anyone allowed to take from those Sfichim? Is a farmer allowed to go out and take some of it for himself? And the answer is no. Why? Because during the Shemitah year, there might be a farmer 
who would want to trick everybody and he'll plant some vegetables and he will say I didn't plant it it grew out by itself now I'm gonna go take these vegetables that's why the farmer is not allowed to take for himself any of the vegetables or grass that grew wild by itself now all the fruits and vegetables which grew in the Shemitah year have a special Kedusha in itself and therefore the Halacha tells us that we have to treat these fruits and vegetables just like we would treat anything which has Kedusha which is holy and therefore no part of the fruits or vegetables may be thrown away just like you throw away garbage instead if there is any leftovers of the fruits or vegetables even the peels they should be placed out in a field and dry until they get rotten because we cannot throw it in the garbage also because the fruits and vegetables of the Shemitah year are so holy they are not allowed to be sold as you usually sell other fruits and vegetables and I want you to know that all of these mitzvahs and all the dinim of Shemitah are not only in the time of the Beis HaMikdash but also in our times too and our Chachamim tell us that of the many reasons why Hashem gave us this mitzvah of Shemitah a very important reason is in order that the Yidden should realize that the land belongs to Hashem that's right it's not the farmers even though he worked on it for six years rather it is Hashem's because the whole land of Eretz Yisrael belongs to Hashem also this reminds a Yid that he always has to have betachen in Hashem that Hashem should give him his needs during the six years the farmer might think that he's getting all of his food because he's working so hard on his fields on his orchards on his vineyards he's doing all the work and that's why he's getting all the food that's why Hashem makes that on the seventh year when he can't do any work at all and he sees that Hashem gives him all of the food that he needs he realizes that also in those six years it is not he but rather Hashem who gives them his needs yes as our Chachamim teach us that no matter how hard a person may work he will not make one cent more than what Hashem wants him to make if a person wants to get the full measure that Hashem set aside for him he should make sure that he's doing his work according to the laws of the Torah that's right that his work does not disturb him from doing the mitzvahs he davens with a minion he keeps Shabbos in the best way he makes sure that he should have everything kosher even during the time when he's at work he only eats things which are a hundred percent kosher and so on and so forth he realizes that all that he has to do is make a keli a vessel in which Hashem is going to put his blessing that's right a person cannot just sit back and say Hashem will give me my parnasa of course a person has to go to work but he has to do only the amount of work that's necessary and that is in a way that it will not disturb him from Tyra and mitzvahs and then Hashem will give him an abundance of Parnassah who will give him so much Parnassah that he will have enough for himself for his family and most of all to be able to share it with others that's right to give tzedakah as the mitzvah is to give miser to give a tenth of all the money that you earn to give it away for tzedakah as a matter of fact our Chachamim tell us that let's say a person earns ten dollars 
How much of the ten dollars does he have to give to tzedakah? Well, at least a tenth, my sir, which is one dollar. So a person should realize that since Hashem wants him to give one tenth to tzedakah, that means Hashem does not want him to keep that money for himself. Hashem wants him to give it away. In other words, when Hashem gave him the ten dollars, Hashem only really gave him nine, and then added one more dollar as shlichus mitzvah, that he should take this one more dollar and give it to tzedakah. And the same thing is if a person earns a hundred dollars. So Hashem really is giving him only ninety, and the other ten, Hashem wants him to be the shliach, the good messenger from Hashem, to give that ten dollars to tzedakah. And the same thing is with any amount that a person earns, the person should realize that only nine parts of it belongs to him, and the tenth part is really Hashem's, and he's not allowed to take it for himself. Hashem wants to give him this chus, give him the mitzvah of giving that part to tzedakah. And Hashem promises us that if we give that tenth to tzedakah, then Hashem is going to give us back ten times as much. And all the parts that you have for yourself will be truly for yourself. It will be used for good and healthy and happy things. Health. Now there is another din about the Shemitah year that all loans are forgiven. Let's say for example Ruvain borrows a hundred dollars from Shimon. Well, of course, Ruvain is going to pay him back. But let's say Ruvain didn't have a chance to pay him back, and it came the Shemitah year. Then the Torah says that Ruvain does not have to pay Shimon the money anymore. We're going to learn much more about this mitzvah. Amir to Hashem in Chumash Devarim in Parshas Re'ei. And now we come to the very special mitzvah of Yoivel. Yoivel is the 50th year. After counting seven times seven years, that means seven times Shemitah, that's 49 years. Then the 50th year is Yoivel. What happens on Yoivel? Well, a few things. First of all, on the Yoivel year, all the farmers have to continue not working on their field. That's right. Even though they just finished the 7th Shemitah, and it's the 49th year, and you can imagine how difficult it is for a farmer not to work on his field for an entire year. He just can't wait to get back into his field. But if this is a Shemitah that comes right before the 50th year, then he is not allowed to work on the field during the 50th year either. In other words, he's going to be skipping two years in a row of work on his field. The 49th year, which is the 7th Shemitah, and the 50th year. But what is he going to have for food? Well, in that case, Hashem promised that Hashem is going to give enough food and the 6th year, not only for the 7th, but also for the 8th and the 9th. That means, not only will he have enough food for the 6th, and the seventh, which is the Shemitah, and the eighth, which is Yaivel, but also for the ninth year, that in the ninth year, until new fruits and vegetables and wheat grow, he will have enough food left over from the sixth year. And another thing that happens on the Yaivel year is that all Jewish servants must be freed. It is on the day of Yom Kippur of each Yovel 
that the basin would blow a shofar. And after they would blow the shofar, all the Jews all over Eretz Yisrael will also blow the shofar. And this is to remind all masters who have servants that are yidden that the time for freeing them has come. Anyone who had a Jewish servant must send them back home. That's right. No matter how much time the servant worked for him, even if he just bought the servant one year before Yoivel, he has to set him free and let him go home because Yoivel came. And the reason for this is because a Jew cannot become a servant of another person forever. Hashem said, When I took the Yitn out of Mitzrayim, they became my servants. And therefore, a Jew cannot become a servant for another Jew forever. And this is also the meaning what we say in Shemayna Esrei. Blow the big shoifar to announce our cheros, our freedom. We are begging Hashem that He should finally blow the big shoifar of Geula. So we should be freed from Galos and come back to our home, Eretz Yisrael and the Beis HaMikdash. Now the Torah tells us of another din about the Yovel year. And that is that any field that was sold to another Yid will go back to its original owner. Let's say, for example, Ruvain had a beautiful field, but he became very poor and he decided to sell it to Shimon. Shimon was very happy with the deal and gave money to Reuven. But later, when the Yovel year comes, the field goes back to Reuven. That's right, he doesn't even have to pay for it. He gets it back for free. Well, why should Shimon pay so much money for it then, if it's going to go back by Yovel? That's why the Torah says that whoever wants to buy a field from his friend should figure out how many years are left to the Yovel. If there are many years, then he should pay more money. If there are very few years left, or maybe just one year left, then he should pay much less money. Because whatever the case would be, when Yovel comes, the field is going to go back to the first owner. So that means that even if Shimon sold the field to Levi, and later Levi to Yehuda, and Yehuda to Yisachar, and so on, when Yovel comes, who's going to get the field back again? That's right, Reuven. In fact, the Torah tells us that Hashem does not want a Yid to sell his field in a way that it should stay for keeps and forever by the one who bought it. Hashem says, the land is mine, and you have no right to sell it, that it should stay forever in other people's hands. Hashem gave every Yid his share in Eretz Yisrael, and Hashem wants it to stay that way. True, Hashem allows you to sell it for a short time. Well then, it's just like renting it. You're renting it to someone, and when the time is up, and that is Yovel, it comes back to you. Now the Torah tells us that only by a field will it go back to its original owner by Yovel. But sometimes a person who sold his house may never get it back again. Sometimes he will and sometimes he won't. And it depends where is his house. Now we all know that when Yehoshua conquered Eretz Yisrael and brought all the Yidden into the land, they found many, many different kinds of cities. Some of the cities had walls around them, and some of the cities did not. 
Now let's say I had a house in one of those cities that had a wall during the time when Yeshua conquered the land. Then the house that I sold will come back to me at the Yovel year. But what if I had a house in a city that did not have a wall in the times of Yehoshua? Then the house will not be returned to me at the Yovel year. That's right. If I sold it to someone, it's going to stay by him forever. The only thing is that from the day that I sold it, I have exactly one year to buy it back. If during the first year after I sold it, I bought it back, I'm lucky. Then the person has to give it back to me. Of course, I have to pay him the money for it. But what if the year is over? Then it stays by the new owner's hands forever. He could sell it, of course, to me, but he doesn't have to. And I have no right to get it back from him. But there is an exception to this rule. What if a levy sold his house, which was in one of the 48 cities that belonged to the Levium? Then the Levium could always get back their house by Yovel. And it did not make a difference whether it was a city that had a wall in the time of Yahushua or it didn't have a wall in the time of Yahushua. The Levi will always get his house back on the Yovel year. And now the Torah tells us about the mitzvah concerning a Noas Mamain, that we're not allowed to cheat another Yid when you're buying or selling. We just talked about a person buying a field. Or a person selling a field? Well, you have to be very honest with the person. Let's say there are only a few years left to Yoivel. So make sure that the price fits the amount of years. It shouldn't be too much or too less. You must act honestly. And this is not only when you're talking about a field and about Yoivel, but any kind of business at all or even trading things, which is something which happens once in a while. Let's say you come to yeshiva, and you have a beautiful pencil. It's such a nice, beautiful pencil. Everyone who sees it gets excited and would like to have it. Let's say a friend of yours comes over to you, says, Ooh, I'll pay you $5 for that pencil. Can you sell it to me? And you only pay 20 cents for it. But this friend of yours is so excited and so anxious to get it. And you see the $5 bill in his hand. The Yetzirah might say, Sure, sell it to him for $5. Why not? You'll get $5. You'll be able to buy some good things for yourself. The Tyrus says, No, you're not allowed to cheat someone. If he doesn't realize his mistake, that he's ready to pay $5, for a pencil which he can get for only 20 cents, don't take advantage of him. Be honest with him. If you want to sell it to him, sell it to him for the decent price. If you don't want to sell it to him, don't. But don't take $5 from him. And the same thing is also in the opposite way. Let's say that you saw a little boy with a beautiful watch. And you want to get that watch for yourself. And you say to the boy, Here, I'll give you a dollar for it. Do you want to sell it to me for a dollar? And the boy doesn't realize that if he sells it for a dollar, he's getting too little money for it. <laughs> the watch is worth much, much more. But the little boy just doesn't realize it. So if you're going to buy it from him for only one dollar, you're cheating him. And that's what the Torah tells us about. The Torah warns us that whenever you make any kind of deals, selling or buying, you must do it honestly. Then the Torah also tells us 
that any dealings that you do, buying or selling, if you have a choice between doing the business with a Yid or Lahavdila guy, it's better to do your business with a Yid who keeps the Torah and mitzvahs. Unless you'll get a much better deal by doing the business with a guy, then you don't have to go to the Yid first. You're allowed to go to the guy. But if they're both equal, it's better to do your business with a Yid. And of course, to do it honestly. And now we come to a very, very important mitzvah that is connected to Avas Yisrael, and that is the mitzvah of Einoas Devarim. Never to say words that may hurt another Jew's feelings. For example, we are not allowed to say to a ger, Do you remember before you became a ger? What kind of life you had? You remember the avarice you used to do? You used to worship idols? To say such words to a ger is a sin. The same thing is also about a Baal Teshuva, someone who was not religious, and then became a Baal Teshuva and started to keep all the mitzvahs. So you're not allowed to say to him, Do you remember the things that you used to do? You remember all those Haveris? You're not allowed to remind a Yid of his past. Doing so will only cause him a lot of pain. Also, the Torah tells us another example of what means hurting someone's feelings. If you see someone suffering, you may not tell him, I know why you are suffering. It's your own fault. Hashem is punishing you because you did such and such a sin. You're never allowed to say that. You're not supposed to judge a Yid in such a way. True, the Rambam says that if a person sees that a punishment comes to himself, then he's supposed to look into his deeds and see whether he's doing the mitzvahs right or whether he's doing any avaris and find something that he's supposed to correct in himself. But this the Rambam is telling us to do for ourselves, not to criticize someone else, not to look at another Jew this way. If you ever see another Jew suffering, try to help him using comforting words, words to make him feel encouraged, to strengthen his betachin, that everything will become better. But never ever to say to a Yid, good for you, it serves you right, you deserve it. Such words should never be said. We know how we would feel if someone said that to us. So let us never say that to another Yid. Another example is, let's say, you're passing by a store and you see some nice things in the window. You're not really interested in buying it, but you want to look at it. You walk into the store and you start asking the storekeeper questions about it and you're not even interested in buying it. That is an Avera because you are making the storekeeper think that you're going to buy something. So you're building up his hopes. And later you're just going to walk out of the store. Is that going to make him feel good? Of course not. So that's why we must be careful. Never give a person an impression that you're going to do something good for him if you don't have any intention to do so. And yet another example of hurting someone by words is let's say someone asks you for something and you answer him back rudely, in not a nice way. For example, let's say someone says to you, Are you going upstairs? Can you take this up for me? No, I'm not going upstairs now. Or, can I borrow your pencil? No, I'm using it right now. That's not the right way that a Jew should answer. 
because those words can hurt someone's feelings. Instead, you should show that you're sorry that you can't help the person then. For example, when the person asked you if you're going upstairs to take something up for him, you could say, Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not going up there right now, maybe a little later. When the person asked you for a pencil, and let's say you're using it and you can't lend it to him, Oh, I'm so sorry, I would love to lend you my pencil, but I must finish this right now. Ask me a little bit later, I'll be more than glad to lend it to you. Yes, this is the way a Yid should speak. And never, ever to use a language that can hurt someone's feelings. Another thing that we must be very, very careful about is never to call a Yid by a nickname that may hurt his feelings, like making fun of a person's name, or making fun of someone of his family, or making fun of something that's wrong with him. Let's say someone who can't walk straight, or if something is wrong on his face. We should not make fun of him or call him a nickname. Instead, we should feel sorry for him and show him that we respect him anyway. Then there is another very important thing. Never to give a person an incorrect answer on purpose. Let's say someone asks you a question in Chumash, and you know the right answer, but instead of telling it to him, you decided uh, just for the fun of it or for whatever other reason that you're going to tell him the wrong answer. That is a sin, and that we have to watch out for. Of course, we're not talking about a person who gave the wrong answer by mistake. We're talking about someone who knows the right answer and knows what should be said, but he purposely says the wrong thing. And by this mitzvah, the Torah tells us, You should fear your God. Why does the Torah tell us this by this mitzvah? Because this is one of those mitzvahs that has to do with the thoughts in your heart. Sometimes a person can make believe that he's very innocent and he doesn't mean to hurt someone's feelings, he doesn't mean to give wrong advice, but deep down in his heart, he really means to hurt someone. That's why it says, You should be afraid of Hashem, who knows what's doing in your heart. Hashem knows what you're thinking about. And since Hashem knows, you better be careful and do exactly as Hashem wants you to do. And our Chachamim tell us that it is worse to hurt someone's feelings than cheating someone from his belongings. Because when you cheat someone and you take something from his belongings that you shouldn't, you could always return it to him and do teshuva. It's easy to fix. But when you hurt someone's feelings, that hurts him right through his heart. And it takes much, much longer to heal. Sometimes, if a person was cheated from a few dollars or from something that he owns, after a while he forgets about it. But if something bad was said to him that hurt his feelings, that can remain with him for many, many years to come. And that's why the Torah tells us, You shall fear your God to show us how serious this Avera is. And now the Torah tells us about a very important mitzvah of helping another Yid when he is in need. Let's say that you know of another Yid who had his business going very well, but then suddenly something happened and he started to lose his money. He did not lose his entire business yet, but he lost a lot of money and he must have help immediately in order that he shouldn't lose his business completely. 
then you have a mitzvah to either lend him money or give him tzedakah. Then you're going to save him from falling down completely and becoming completely poor. And this mitzvah is both for a yid, that means to help another yid, or to help a ger toishav. That is, when the yidin lived in Eretz Yisrael, if a guy wanted to live in Eretz Yisrael, they were only allowed to live there if they kept the seven mitzvahs of the B'nai Noyach. And a guy who keeps the seven mitzvahs of B'nai Noyach is called Ger Toishav. So, if you see a Ger Toishav who is losing his business, you have a mitzvah to help him too. And by helping him now, it will be so much easier than waiting for him to fall down completely and trying to help him. Like the example, if you see a donkey carrying a very, very heavy load of many, many packages, and suddenly you see that the donkey is going to fall down because it has too many packages. So you can run over right away and help the donkey by taking off some of the packages or straightening it out, making it easier for the donkey. And if you do so, the donkey will be able to continue walking on. All it took, the work of one man, that is you. But if you wait a while, and the donkey falls down with all the packages, <laughs> do you know how many people you're going to need to help the donkey back up again? Not just one, you may need five people to help. That's right, once it falls, it takes so much more work to get it back up. And the same thing is with helping another Yid. Don't wait till he falls down completely and loses all his money, and then he has to go collect tzedakah. But rather, while he's still in his business, help him out, strengthen him any way you can, both with your money and good advice, and of course, good encouraging words. The Medrash tells us about a story of Reb Yoyna. Whenever he heard that a rich man lost all of his money, but was ashamed to go around asking for tzedakah, you know what Reb Yoyna used to do? He used to visit the rich man and tell him, Oh, I heard good news. I heard you're getting a lot of money from somewhere. Wow. So you know what? Meanwhile... Please accept a little loan from me. Here, take this money, and you'll pay me back when you have a chance. Later, when the man would become rich again, and would want to give the money to Reb Yoyna, he would say, Keep it. I gave it to you as a gift. Yes, this was a way to give tzedakah, and a way to make the person feel good. And in this chus of giving tzedakah, Hashem will do tzedakah with you. We never know when we need extra tzedakah from Hashem. Not just money, but sometimes help. Sometimes we or someone of our family could be in a place that is a little dangerous and we need an extra bracha from Hashem. And because we gave tzedakah, Tzedakah tatzil mi maves. Tzedakah saves a person from death. Tzedakah is so powerful. As our Chachamim tell us, there are ten things that Hashem created in this world. Each one is stronger than the other. Rock is strong, but iron breaks it. Iron is strong, but if you take fire, fire can melt it. So that means fire is stronger than iron. And what's stronger than fire? Water, because water can put out fire. Well, water is very strong, but there's something stronger than it. The clouds, they can carry it. And what's stronger than clouds? 
the wind. Yes, the wind can spread the clouds apart. Well, if wind is so strong, what's stronger than wind? The body. That's right, the body holds wind in it. Now, what's stronger than the body? Fear. Because when a person is afraid of something, a person has fear, it breaks the body. And then comes the ninth thing, is death. Yes, that is stronger than all the other things. But then comes the tenth, which is stronger even than death. And what is it? Tzedakah. That's the most powerful, because it can save a person from death. We're going to learn much more about Tzedakah, Mir Hashem, in Chumash Devarim, Parshas Re'ei. Now, when a person does lend money to another Yid, there are certain dinim about it. One of them is that you're not allowed to lend with ribis, interest. That means that you're not allowed to lend money to someone expecting him to pay you back more. Let's say you lend him a hundred dollars. You're not allowed to ask him to give you back even one penny more. He's supposed to pay you back only the same amount that you lent him. Let's say someone borrows from you two pencils. He's not supposed to pay you back three. And this is a mitzvah for both people, the one who gives and the one who takes. The one who lends the money or lends the thing is not allowed to ask for more. And the one who gets it and is supposed to pay back is not allowed to give more. And not only is he not allowed to give back more than what he borrowed, he's not even allowed to say extra words, like to say thank you. If I borrowed money from someone, so when I pay him back, I'm not supposed to even say thank you. Because by saying thank you, I'm giving him something more than what I took from him. I borrowed, let's say, one dollar, and I paid him back one dollar with a thank you. Well, then that's extra. When a person lends money or borrows, the money has to be returned exactly in the same amount. And the same thing is with fruits, vegetables, clothing, anything. It should be returned exactly in the same amount as it was taken. And do you know what the Torah calls this? The Torah calls it Neshech. Neshach means to bite. That's right. It's just like a snake that bites someone. The same thing if a person goes to his friend and says, Oh, I see you need money. Here, I'll be so kind and I'll lend you a hundred dollars. But later you're going to have to pay me back a hundred and ten dollars. Do you want that? And the guy who needs the hundred dollars needs it so badly that he might agree. And later, when he doesn't have the money to pay back, you know what the guy is going to do? He'll say, well, if you don't pay me back my money, I'm going to start taking away your things. I'll take your field, I'll take your house, I'll take your belongings. That's acting like a snake. That's why it's called neshach, which means a bite. If you lend someone money, you should do it without asking for anything extra back. And that's why it's called Gemilus Chasadim, performance of kindness. Because that's what Chesed, kindness, is all about. Not that you expect to get extra back, but rather just to get back the amount that you lent him. And the Torah tells us, after this Pasuk, it says, Ani Hashem Aleikechem, Asher Hoytseisi Eschem Me Eretz Mitzrayim. I am Hashem your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. Now, why is it necessary to mention Yitzias Mitzrayim by this mitzvah? It's in order to remind us 
that just like in Mitzrayim, Hashem made a difference between the firstborn, the Bechayrim of the Mitzrayim, and the Bechayrim of the Yidden, and He only killed out the firstborn of the Mitzrayim? The same thing. It is Hashem who will know if someone did the Avera of Neshech and Ribis, of taking extra money back. And another reason why it mentions Yitzias Mitzrayim, to tell us that the only purpose why Hashem took the Yidn out of Mitzrayim was in order that the Yidn should keep all the mitzvahs of the Tyra, not only those that he thinks are easy, but also those mitzvahs that may be difficult. For example, this mitzvah of not taking extra money, you may think to yourself, if I kept the money for myself, I could have done some business with it and make more money. Now that I'm lending it to another Yid, I can't get anything out of it. It's true that in Gashmias, in the physical world, we don't see that we're getting anything out of it. But first of all, you're helping another Yid. Second of all, you're getting a mitzvah of Gemilas Chasadim. And that's why it mentions Yitzias Mitzrayim that we should know that even a mitzvah which is difficult to keep, we must keep it too. Because it was for this purpose that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. And now the Torah is going to tell us how a master is supposed to treat his Jewish slave. In Parshish Mishpatim, we learned many laws about this, but there it's talking about a Jewish slave that was sold by the Bastin. Let's say they caught a Jew stealing, and then the Jew did not have money to pay it back, so the Bastin sells him as a slave, and from the money that he gets, he can pay it back. This Parsha talks about someone who sold himself as a slave. Why should a Jew want to sell himself as a slave? Well, let's say he's so poor and he has no money for himself or for his family. Then he's allowed to sell himself as a slave. If he's just selling himself because he wants to get some extra money or he wants to get some property for himself or some animals or other goods, then he's not allowed to sell himself as a slave. But if he's selling himself just because he has no money at all and he just has to get some money for himself and his family, then it is permitted. But there are certain laws how the master is supposed to treat him. Usually, a master can tell his slave to do any kind of work. He can tell him to put on his shoes for him. He can tell him to bring his clothes to the bathhouse for him. But that's not when you have a Jewish slave. A Jewish slave has to be treated with respect. He can only give him work to do, which is nice work like skilled work or working on the field or so but not any kind of dirty work also he has to give food for the slave and if the slave has a wife and children he has to feed them too and he can't just give them plain junky food he has to give them from the same kind of food drink clothing beds just as he uses for himself. Also, he has to give the slave a very good room to live in. Not only that, let's say there's only one pillow or one blanket in the house. Who should get it? The master or the slave? Well, the Torah says, the master should not use it. He should give it to the slave. The slave should use it instead. No wonder our Chachamim say, He who gets a slave for himself is like getting a master for himself. That's right, because he has to treat him 
with a lot of respect. And therefore it's understood that he can't tell this Jewish slave to do some kind of work that he doesn't really need. Like sometimes there are masters who just want to keep their slave busy, so they tell him to do certain things which they really don't need. For example, to tell him, warm some water for me, or cool some water for me, and he really doesn't need it. Also, he's not allowed to tell the Jewish slave to do a job without telling him how long will he have to do it. For example, he can't tell him, I want you to dig a hole under this vine and keep on doing it until I come back. And you're not even telling him how long you're going to be gone. And that's why again here, the Torah says, V'yoreisa me'elekecha you should fear Hashem, your God. Why? Because over here too, the master may think, nobody knows what's doing in my heart, why I'm giving him this work. That's why the Torah says, V'yoreisa you should fear your God, and then you will not give him any kind of work that you're not supposed to. Now what's about a person who bought a non-Jewish slave? Well then, even though in many dinim it is different that he is allowed to give him hard work, yet our Chachamim say that it is better to treat all slaves nicely and respectfully, also a non-Jewish slave. When Yovel comes, every Jewish slave goes free like we learned in the beginning of the Parsha. Hashem said, Every Yid is my slave since Yitzias Mitzrayim. And now the Torah tells us of a very strange case. What happened if a Yid sold himself to a Goy? Let's say a Yid was very, very poor in the time of the Beis HaMikdash and he would like to sell himself as a slave to get some money but he didn't find any Jewish guy who wants to buy him so he ended up selling himself to a guy did he do the right thing? <laughs> of course not because if you're going to be a servant to a guy soon you're going to learn from their bad ways and start chas v'shalom serving idols and doing all the other bad things of the goyim but still some yidden were so poor that they sold themselves to goyim who served idols so the Torah tells us anyone who is related to this yid who became a slave for the goy has a mitzvah to buy him back from the guy as soon as possible. And what if this Yid has no relatives? Then any Yid has a mitzvah to buy him back. And the Torah also commands that the Jewish government in Eretz Yisrael should force the Goyish masters to let their Jewish servants go free in the year of Yoivel. Then the Torah tells us, Hashem said to Moshe, Those Goyim who worship idols, they set up their matzevois, their big pillars of stone in their getchka houses. And I don't want Yitten to do the same thing, to put up any matzeva anywhere even if it's just for me. Yes, even though Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov set up Matzevais, as we learned in Chumash Bereshis, but once the Torah was given, Hashem doesn't want this anymore in order to keep us far away from the idol worshippers. And Hashem also said, You may not fall down before me on a stone floor. 
Yes, those who worship idols used to make beautiful stone floors for serving their gechkes. Therefore the Torah says that a Jew should never get down on his knees, kneel down on a stone floor, even while he's davening to Hashem. And by keeping this mitzvah, it helps us stay away from serving idols. But there was one exception to this rule. In the Beis Amikdash, the floor was made out of stone, and the Yitten would bow down to Hashem, they will get down on their knees and lie down flat when they would bow down to Hashem in the Beis Amikdash, even though it was on a stone floor. And very, very soon, we're going to be once again in the Beis Hamikdash, the third Beis Hamikdash that's going to come down from heaven, where we will all witness the great miracles of Hashem, and we'll once again be able to bow down to Hashem in the Beis Hamikdash through the coming of Mashiach Tzedkenu, speedily in our days. Amen. Speedily in our days.